Hey there chemists, in this video we're going to look at how chemists use infrared or IR spectroscopy to identify parts of molecules and continue in our discussion of just how we identify structures and draw a picture of a molecule when we have a sample of something. Just like mass spectrometry, IR spectroscopy is an analytical technique. You often can do it with very small amounts of material um, and it's being used right now. It's a very modern and current technique that's quick and easy to do to tell us some information about a molecule. The main point of infrared spectroscopy is that it answers the question, what bonds are present? So it doesn't tell us a complete structure, but it answers the question, are there certain types of bonds found in a molecule? And on top of your notes, I have a diagram that I borrowed from the Compound Chemistry website. Uh, there's a lot of useful infographics on that website. And this uh, is, is quite nice and shows us the regions in the infrared spectrum. These are called wave numbers. Uh, they're, they're based on inverse frequencies uh, of where certain types of bond stretches show up. So if a molecule contains a carbon-hydrogen bond or a carbon-carbon triple bond, or a carbon-nitrogen triple bond, or an oxygen-hydrogen single bond, we'll be able to see those in the IR spectrum. And for us, that means that it answers what functional group is present. You know, a carbon-carbon triple bond means I have an alkyne, or a CN would be a nitrile, an OH could be an alcohol, uh, or an acid. You notice both of those show up quite far to the left in this spectrum. There's little keyed letters that indicate if it's a medium or a strong or a weak signal. Um, we're just concerned with where along the x-axis these signals are shown. And what we're gonna learn is simply how to interpret a spectra and figure out what kinds of bonds are present in a molecule and what kinds of bonds are not present. So if we look at a few examples, uh, here's a cyclopentanone molecule, and this is the spectrum of cyclopentanone. So if we looked at the structure first and asked ourselves, what bonds should we see? Well, there's certainly carbon-carbon single bonds. There are carbon-hydrogen single bonds, and there are carbon-oxygen double bonds, one carbon-oxygen double bond. And that's it. There's nothing else in the cyclopentanone molecule. So you might go, why are there not only three signals in the IR spectrum of this? I see so much information especially far to the right. And that's because not all bonds do the same thing in an IR spectrum, and there's multiple things any given bond can do. Uh, they can stretch, they can wag, they can bend, and each of those absorbs a certain amount of energy in the infrared region of the EM spectrum. So we actually end up seeing lots of absorptions, potentially for one type of bond. For this course, we're just gonna look at everything that's to the left of about 1500 or so, because everything to the right of that is so crowded with multiple signals, and it's known as the fingerprint region. This is quite useful if you are trying to match the spectrum of a molecule to a known spectrum. Uh, you can imagine a forensic chemist using this to literally line up a spectrum of an unknown substance to see if it matches something that's already known cataloged in a database. Uh, but if you're a synthetic chemist making something brand new that's never been made before, it's, it's less useful because we have nothing to match it with. And everything to the left of 1500 is a little more resolved and we can make sense of what bonds are present. So uh, reading from left to right, uh, at 3000, we have our CH bonds. They usually show up right around 3,000, just above and below. We can see that from in our, our reference sheet up above. You'll always be given these reference sheets if you ever have to do any kind of assessment for us, so it's just important to know how to use it. And then at around 1,700, we have our carbon-oxygen double bond that happens to be due to the ketone. And that's all we can identify out of this. So if I took a spectrum of this and did not know that it was the cyclopentanone molecule, I wouldn't necessarily know what the structure is, but I would know, oh, it's got a carbonyl and it's got hydrocarbon. It's got carbons attached to hydrogens, and that's it. You might go, where's the carbon-carbon single bond? Isn't that also in this molecule? Yeah, that's buried in the fingerprint region, along with a lot of other uh, vibrations and stretches that we see in the spectrum. So 
at the bottom, there are just two other spectra. And I want you to hit the pause button and knowing that these are the spectra that go with these compounds, hit pause and see if you can identify what signals in the spectrum correspond to the bonds in those structures. Okay, so um, at the first one, A, we have a phenol, so we have an OH group. Uh, the OH is usually a very broad signal that shows up way to the left in the 3000s, so that's got to be this large well. You'll notice in IR spectroscopy, uh, the signals are actually troughs. They're these things that dip down from the top. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not peaks, they're actually troughs, although many people still call them peaks. That's what we look at, these dips from the top. That's just how it's normally done. You can invert it, but most spectra are drawn this way. In addition to the OH, there are CH bonds. There's multiple types of CH bonds. They're all quite buried in the 3000s, and they're hard to see underneath the OH, but they must be there. I'll make a note that we have both sp2 CH bonds and we have sp3 CH bonds, which respectively show up a little bit above 3000 and a little bit below 3000 as you go left to right. And you do see both of them because the CH3 is an sp3, and these H's are sp2 CH's. And then there is some carbon-carbon double bond character, even though we don't have isolated double bonds because of the, re the resonance in the benzene ring, uh, we still see absorptions that, that fall in that range. And then the last one, this ester, uh, I see carbon-hydrogen bonds, and I see a carbonyl, and that's about it. There's nothing else useful in this. But this is a good example to close with and point out that the absence of stretches in an IR spectrum is often just as meaningful uh, when we're looking at a spectrum. You know, this has no OH stretch and it has no uh, alkyne stretch. So the absence of a peak is often just as meaningful as the presence of a peak if you're trying to identify what a molecule is, maybe to prove that a reaction occurred or didn't occur when being compound. Okay, so that's a very brief introduction to how chemists use IR spectroscopy to start to identify molecules.